Well, there's a new administration and a new secretary of education. What is not new is the friction between some local governments and teacher unions. And nothing going on in Washington is going to change that anytime soon. Here to talk about what unions can do to promote social justice is Bob Peterson, past president of the Milwaukee Teachers Association and currently the citywide representative on the Milwaukee School Board. Dr. Peterson taught fifth grade for over 25 years in Milwaukee and is founding editor of Rethinking Schools magazine. Bob Peterson is also co-editor of the new book, Teacher Unions and Social Justice, Organizing for the Schools and Communities Our Students Deserve, a collection of articles from Rethinking Schools. Before we got into the meat of our conversation, though, I asked him about Rethinking Schools magazine. Well, Rethinking Schools actually started in 1986 on my kitchen table with a can of rubber cement and an Apple IIe computer. It grew out of a, a study group of some teachers and community members And we had just sort of gotten tired of our teacher union newsletter and academic journals on education. And we thought, well, what the heck, let's start our own publication. And we started a uh, a newsprint tabloid that was first 12 pages, and it went up to like 48 pages eventually. We passed it out free in schools in Milwaukee. And we looked at things from two lenses, Uh, one from the lens of the practicing classroom teacher, uh, not from a legislator who likes to tell us what to do, but hasn't have been in school since they were in high school. And secondly, through the r- lens of racial and social justice that we felt was essential for rethinking our schools, rethinking education. From there, it uh, panned out. We published a book called Rethinking Columbus in 1992 at the Quincentennial, and we became nationally known. Some more editors joined us from around the country. And we have been publishing a quarterly magazine for 35 years and now have published over 20 books written mainly by practicing classroom teachers. Well, tell me about the history of this new project, Teacher Unions and Social <clears throat> Justice. Where, where did this come from? Actually, it has its roots back quite a ways. You know, for many years, uh, obviously, teacher unions have played a very important role, especially since the 60s and 70s, 1970s. But their role has been at times contradictory. Sometimes the unions are less than democratic. Uh, Sometimes they're just focused so exclusively on the needs of their members, which is understandable, but at the expense of families and communities. So there's been rank and file caucuses. I was part of a couple here in Milwaukee as I became a new teacher back in the 1980s. And we really basically pushed our union to try to take up, uh, become more democratic and take up certain uh, issues in the community. Now, what happened ultimately is through Rethinking Schools, we're in contact with teacher union activists uh, around the country, and we got together at a couple of different national conferences of the National Coalition of Education Activists, which was unions and community people. And We issued a a statement uh, after a three-day institute in 1984, the gathering was 1994, not 84, calling on uh, teacher union activists to promote social justice teacher unionism. And soon after that, um, myself and one of my co-editors of the current book published a book in Rethinking Schools of some of our writings called Transforming Teacher Unions. And it, it talked about these kind of issues. Um, But it didn't really get the attention which our current book is getting, because right now I think there's a lot of different things happening with teacher unions, which we're going to talk about. Recently, after what was called the Red for Ed revolts in uh, Virginia and Kentucky, my colleague Michael Charney, who had worked with the Cleveland Teachers Union, and then we got together with another Rethinking Schools editor, Jesse Hagopian, out of Seattle, a younger teacher who was very active, and we decided to put out a new anthology of teacher unions and social justice, organizing for the schools and communities our students deserve. This is such a varied book, and there's so much to uh, delve into here. I'm very interested to see that you started with history, pretty much starting from the beginning, uh, and a, a great conversation and article with, with with Howard Zinn. Talk about that, Will, because I see you wrote that one, didn't you? Yeah, I was uh, very pleased to have been able to interview him and spend some time with him. You know, his uh, People's History of the United States is a seminal work that I know a lot of high school teachers still use, despite some criticisms by conservative school boards and other folks. And, 
you know, he really put the kind of the issue of social justice unionism in a broader context, going beyond teachers and talking about the need for all unions to be aware, not just of their narrow trade union interests, but class-wide interests. So even people, we should, union members should look out for people who are not in unions uh, because they're having issues at their workplace as well. Similarly, one of the things that he said in the interview, which we have in the book, is he, he said, you know, teacher activists should not only be good teacher unionists, but they should also be teachers of unionism and other social justice movements. And that's one of the very distinct ideas in the new book, The Teacher Unions and Social Justice. We have a whole chapter on it, on it actually, is bringing social justice into the classroom. I believe as a teacher, and I tried in my practice of 25 years as a fifth grade teacher, that teachers have a moral and civil, civic responsibility to teach children about what's going on in the world and help them and nurture a disposition uh, to want to help uh, help their fellow persons and protect the planet and to work collaboratively with others for social justice. But let's go back to the issue of history, which you talk about. There are some really good examples of teacher unions in the early in the in early 1900s, the mid 1900s, and recently, which show that a teacher unions who take up the issues of the community can be very powerful, incredibly helpful for the needs of the community. We look at New York a City, uh, Chicago. Those are two unions that have historically had very different approaches at different times. In New York, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, the group called Teacher Unions, you really did a lot of work in Harlem and promoting uh, the construction of, of schools and neighborhoods that had been neglected, promoting African-American history. And they were really strong in terms of their ability to influence public policy. Similarly, in Chicago, there was a huge movement to go beyond traditional schooling and to push the powers that be um, to f- adequately fund schools in a way that allows, what, first of all, uh, teachers, and especially women teachers at that time, to get uh, equal pay. The history is inspiring, and that's why we included in the first chapter called Our Roots a lot of that. But then we, we go on to more recent history, the 2012 Teachers Union strike in Chicago, and then the 1994 call for social justice unionism by the a group of teacher union activists that I mentioned, and right up to the strikes recently or a couple of years ago in Virginia and Kentucky. Going way back for a second here, one of the parts of the book that, that that's included is a speech by Margaret Haley back in 1904. So this has some long roots, doesn't it? Yeah, she was speaking at the NEA National Convention. And she definitely uh, told it like it like it is in the sense that she she was an advocate both for all teachers, but also for students. She really bumped heads with the corporate elite in Chicago at the time. And she spoke about the need for organization. You know, at the time, many people, teachers were looking at uh, becoming teachers as a way to get out of the working class and not necessarily identifying as workers but trying more to be quote so-called professionals. But what became clear very early on is that, that one should be both. One, you certainly take a professional attitude towards your work in terms of teaching, but at the same time, you are a worker and you need to unite to defend your rights and to promote quality education and anti-discrimination. You know, that there was, and that was a long struggle for many years up until the fifties, uh, women were being, uh, basically fired if they got pregnant, sometimes in some cases if they got married. So it was through the struggles of unions originally that really got us to the place where uh, we are today. And we're trying to build on that, the positive of the past and critique some of the negative parts. And we give many examples of how to move forward in our book. One of the articles focuses on the Seattle 2015 teacher strike and it says that one of the uh, th- there were a bunch of things that the, that the union got out of that strike. A lot of social justice goals were met. And one of them, the first one, 
was the uh, end to st- uh, standardized test scores being used. How is that seen as a social justice victory? And I guess I'll say, how do you define social justice? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I would think in terms of the testing, though, it's I think this issue of social justice and testing is, is very real. It's Data shows and research has shown mass standardized testing correlates most to a kid's socioeconomic status and somewhat to the race. And it doesn't really measure, it it measures a very, very narrow component of what I would consider an educated citizen, educated person. And so testing has been used recently as a way to either standardize the curriculum uh, including basically straightjacketing teachers so that they hardly, at the elementary level, just focus mainly on re- reading and math, not on social studies, not on the arts, not on science. Furthermore, poor test scores can put you in certain categories that might mean a state takeover or a charter uh, privatization of your school. This is what we've struggled against in Wisconsin. We, there's an article about it, three different attempts at takeovers by uh, the Republican governor, Scott Walker, and actually by one Democratic governor who preceded Scott Walker, just to be fair in terms of some of the critiques of our political processes. You know, in terms of social justice generally, though, I'd say two things. One, it's inherently in this country connected to racial justice, because I, th- I see that racial justice, a racial injustice, Uh, particularly anti-Black racism, but racism against Indigenous people, Latinx and Asian Americans and others is very intense. It comes through sometimes in school curriculum. It comes through by in conversations with teachers who are biased, uh, racist themselves at times. So teacher unions, I believe, have a responsibility to really fight against those kind of things. That, that is racism, either systematic racism within school districts, such as uh, punitive forms of punishment instead of restorative forms of punishment, uh, that which lead, the latter, uh, the former, which leads to the increase in the school to prison pipeline. I think the other form of social justice, though, is also definitely economic and democratic. That is to say, I don't believe that the people who run our society should be the most wealthy or get sort of paid off by the wealthy. I think we should have a more a small d democratic society. And I believe that schools can be and should be greenhouses of that democracy, both in how they run, and that is to say democratically, not just top down by a principle. And secondly, the classrooms should be more democratic. Students should have a voice in what they study. We should look at the lives of the students in that case. And also the whole process of promoting public schools as a fundamental bedrock of our democratic society to the degree that it is democratic. You know, one thing I say, I said to my fifth graders um, for many years, I said, you know, we, we need civic courage. We need to act as if we live in a democracy because our democratic ideals of our country are great, but They're tarnished at times, as we've witnessed in the last several years. Still to come, our conversation with Bob Peterson continues with a look at the priorities of unions in other countries. That's next on The Best of Our Knowledge. Got any questions or comments about the best of our knowledge? Send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And if you'd like to listen to this or any past programs again, you can find them online at our flagship station's website. Just go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. And while you're there, subscribe to the Best of Our Knowledge's podcast or download the WAMC radio app to listen on demand anytime, anyplace. This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett, and our guest today is Bob Peterson. He is co-editor of the new book, Teacher Unions and Social Justice, Organizing for the Schools and Communities Our Students Deserve. In one article in the book, Peterson talks to an education leader from another continent. So I asked if there are things we can learn from other countries, or are they taking their cues from us? It's a little bit of both. You know, one thing that's interesting, I've traveled and spoken in both, well, Australia and England, in Canada, 
And when we, I talk to my colleagues and they say, well, what, what do you negotiate about? What's your key negotiation issue? And I said, well, actually, in the United States, a lot of it's about healthcare. You know, we're trying to, you know, teachers deserve healthcare. And they sort of look at me, their jaws drop and they say, healthcare? Well, we don't ever talk about that. We talk about education in our collective bargaining because they have national healthcare systems in those three countries that I just mentioned. That's something to, to keep in mind because. I believe that you know teacher unions should promote national health care, uh, not only for the benefit of their members, but more importantly, even benefit of the students that we serve. But across the country, uh, across the world, excuse me, it, the question of whether or not public education is adequately funded is a huge issue. And the role that private companies are playing in trying to privatize education so privatizing uh, curriculum, privatizing the technology, or actually taking over schools and setting up private networks of schools, in some places like Liberia and Africa, taking over the whole elementary school system of the entire country for a while. It's, there's been pushback. But here in with Milwaukee, where there's a large private school voucher program, in a lot of places uh, around the country where privately run charter schools, uh, tax incentives, but essentially privatized schools, this is a huge danger. And I think it's essential that unions, social justice unions, stand up and defend public schools, but at the same time, acknowledge that there are problems in public schools and we have to transform them as well. When I was union president, I used to say to my members that if there's a school down the street or a classroom down the hallway that you would not send your own children to, then we as a union have our work to do. We have to improve those schools. We have to improve, help our colleagues teach better. And for too long, teacher unions had historically focused so much on bread and butter issues that they sort of gave permission to the administration to control or really lead the pedagogical issues. And I, I think that's wrong. I think we have to do it in jointly. Obviously, school boards and parents have to be consulted and worked with. But teachers are essential and other educational workers, such as paraprofessionals, are essential in the success of a public school system. I once spoke to a doctor some years ago who was a, a specialist in vaccines who told me, and I've heard this since, that vaccines are kind of a, a victim of their own success, that they've done so well that people think they don't need them anymore. Is, are unions having that same issue? Uh, I think in some ways, although unions have really suffered over the last several decades, you know, especially the private sector unions, and there is a concerted attempt to try to put every possible obstacle in the way of organizing new unions or in the power of unions. Like we confronted in Wisconsin, a Republican legislature and Governor Scott Walker, and even though he didn't campaign on it, he attached to a uh, a budget bill, a plan to dis, to eliminate uh, collective bargaining for most public sector workers, to eliminate and actually force us to have a re recertification vote on an annual basis that the unions pay for, and we had to get fifty percent plus one of all people eligible to vote, all like all the teachers or all the substitute teachers or whatever your union was, and if you didn't vote, it was called, considered a no vote. And that's a very punitive approach to democracy. If we use that approach, uh, our governor, Walker, would never have been elected because the people who didn't vote would be considered a no vote. There's a section in the book called Pushing from the Bottom Up, and it, it talks about some of those regional actions that were taken just a few years ago. I could think of the one that started in West Virginia. Have those local right. pockets of activism re-energized the movement? Interesting. Yes, definitely. The, the red wave of teacher strikes in the South absolutely did that. And then that was followed by uh, some powerful strikes in Los Angeles and uh, in Chicago. And so that has revitalized. Un unfortunately, in some places, though, like in Virginia, West Virginia, the, the Republican legislature has sort of swung back and batted down some of the gains that were made. You know, so it's a constant fight. But so, and, and when we say pushing from the bottom up, I mean, it can mean everything from rank and file teachers like in Arizona. We have an article by that where they, um, through the Internet, through uh, Facebook, organize themselves. The union 
was sort of neutral initially. Then it then it came and really supported it. But it was a real rank and file upsurge, demanding that there be adequate funding for schools. You know, enough of this large class sizes and and not enough supplies and so on and so forth. So that that was very inspiring, and that took place on the statewide level. And then we have we show some examples from Baltimore, from Seattle, from Philadelphia, and then North Carolina, where what rank and file caucuses within the union structures, you know, organize and push the union leadership sometimes to uh, a more progressive stance, and sometimes they contest for leadership, like in Baltimore and North Carolina, and they actually win. And these younger uh, social justice committed uh, activists are now in leadership of, say, the Baltimore Teacher Union, the uh, North Carolina Education Association, and I would count there too also in Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Paul, uh, Los Angeles. And we have articles from all those different cities that I just mentioned in the book. And hopefully it will inspire other people uh, in their locales to learn some things from the examples of these uh, writers and the activists and have success in their own uh, school districts. All right. What would you like to talk about that I have not asked you about? Well, one thing is just some very concrete examples I'll give in terms of what a social justice union can look like. And this varies according to so many different things. I'm not saying every union must do this or that. And one of the issues that was pretty interesting was we have an article from um, St. Paul where the union pushed and finally got the administration to agree to have teachers and other educators do home visits. That was part of their contract and it was very much supported. And it did a couple of things. One, it obviously brought the school and community together much more than just uh, a parent conference where sometimes people don't show up. It also broke down some stereotypes. And this article goes in that by white teachers who visit students in uh, communities of color and they, they see how loving and rich those students' lives are, despite sometimes the real economic barriers. And so that's just one example. Another example is what's called peer review. And this is something I promoted when I was president and, and even before in my rank and file caucus in Milwaukee. And that's the notion that teacher unions should help teachers who are struggling to become better. Or if, quite frankly, if, if they're having such issues and they can't improve over time, to, to be gently exited out of uh, the teaching career. And that to me is really important. You hear a lot of complaints. Well, p- teacher unions, they only, they just protect teachers or, you know, you know, and I believe all employees should have due process rights, but teacher unions also should step in and see that it's a social justice issue that every kid is standing, is, is sitting and hopefully more active than that in a classroom, but has in front of them a teacher who is qualified, who is certified, who is sensitive to issues of race and gender and wants to engage in a kind of pedagogy that really relates to kids' lives and brings the classroom alive, lights the fire of wanting to learn and read and write and understand what's going on in the world amongst the students. And that certainly is one of the the reasons that I believe that unions should take up the issue of social justice, both in their own union making sure that everybody is uh, involved, but in, especially in terms of women and uh, uh, people of color, and also in their schools, in their community, and in the curriculum. Bob Peterson is a co-editor of the new book, Teacher Unions and Social Justice, Organizing for the Schools and Communities Our Students Deserve. He is also past president of the Milwaukee Teachers Association and currently the citywide representative on the Milwaukee School Board. Dr. Peterson taught fifth grade for over 25 years in Milwaukee and is founding editor of Rethinking Schools magazine. Can a student's mental health factor into their college success? That's the topic of today's Academic Minute. Mental health disabilities can be hidden, but still have a large effect on college students' satisfaction on campuses. I'm Dr. Lynn Pascarella, President of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And today on the Academic Minute, Carolyn Braquette, Associate Professor in the College of Health Professions at Mercer University, explains. Students with mental health disabilities are at a higher risk to drop out of college. Understanding factors that influence their satisfaction with higher education can enhance retention efforts. 
My research found that students diagnosed with mental health disabilities had lower levels of satisfaction with college compared to peers who identified as having no disability. However, they reported higher satisfaction than peers diagnosed with other types of disabilities. Study participants indicated having a hidden disability as the major factor for their higher level of satisfaction. They saw the ability to refrain from disclosing their mental health diagnosis as an advantage over students with visible disabilities and mobility impairments. Participants reported being reluctant to disclose their mental health diagnosis due to fear of being treated differently. They also noted that people are uncomfortable with mental illness. Additional factors of influence included negative and positive experiences with professors related to academic accommodations. Negative experiences involved professors who either did not understand the rationale for an accommodation or did not work with the student to accommodate their disability. Although reported as the exception, such interactions still impacted the way participants viewed their college experience. Overall, participants reported they were satisfied with academic advising, support services, and instructional effectiveness. They reported being neutral on campus responsiveness to diverse populations and concern for individuals. And that was Carolyn Brecka of Mercer University. You can find this, other segments, and more information about the professors at academicminute.org. The Academic Minute is a production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio, in partnership with the Association of American Colleges and Universities. That's all the time we have for this week's program. If you'd like to listen again, join us online at our flagship station's website. Just go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. While you're there, subscribe to our podcast or any of the other WAMC or National Productions podcasts. And if you have any questions or comments about the program, send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And you can find us on Twitter at TBOO Knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. Be sure to join us next time for another edition of The Best of Our Knowledge. Bob Barrett is producer of The Best of Our Knowledge. Dr. Alan Shartok is executive producer. The Best of Our Knowledge is a production of WAMC Radio's National Productions, which is solely responsible for its content. Hear more at wamc.org.